The Fortunate Future is brought to you by Nico, the cryptocurrency powering the Nikola Tesla legacy. Join the Nico community at www.nico.eco. Welcome to The Fortunate Future. I'm your host, Limor Markman. On today's show, we'll be discussing the most popular question asked at parties and water coolers. This is the question you've likely been wondering about. What is cryptocurrencies and should you invest? We'll also be covering how to invest in real estate without being a landlord. This way, you'll avoid some of the major headaches many landlords have to deal with. To round out the show, we'll be covering how to respond to economic pessimism in the news headlines when you've invested in commodities. Avoiding the panic and ensuring that your money is safe. It's going to be a great show, so stay tuned. heard of cryptocurrencies and of someone who has made millions of dollars with Bitcoin. You may in fact be wondering if the risk is worth taking in order to increase your net worth and be part of the new worldwide digital marketplace. The likely question on your mind is, should you invest in cryptocurrencies? With me now is Dean Jessup, Chief Operating Officer of Nikola Tesla Unite Limited. Dean, tell me, why should people invest in cryptocurrencies? My first response is, why not? <laughs> but let me explain a little bit more. So it's the future of money. And I say that because most people aren't carrying cash anymore. It's all ones and zeros. They're e-transferring money back and forth. They're using debit cards. They're using credit cards. That's not actually money. Cryptocurrency is ones and zeros, just like what I explained. So we're essentially trading what we're already doing for a way that's new but essentially has the same premise in the background? Um, I, I would agree with the same premise in the background. It's actually not new. It's been around for all, almost nine years now. Good point. Okay, so maybe a little bit more mainstream. Correct. New yes. for, for the average public individual. Correct. Absolutely. So with cryptocurrencies, some of the challenges that I've been hearing is that, in fact, it's a, not backed by anything, and B, there's a ton of volatility when it comes to Bitcoin and all the cryptocurrencies out there. What are your thoughts on those two complaints that people have? I get that uh, response probably three or four times a day. No doubt. <laughs> so the easiest thing is the dollar bills that are in your pocket right now aren't backed by anything. Money is not backed by gold. Money is not backed by any asset just like cryptocurrency isn't backed by any gold or any asset. And I think that people are often surprised to hear that. Yes, it changed many decades ago Yeah. quietly. Right. It's now called fiat. Fiat means it's not a, a currency that's not backed by anything. Right. Now, what about the volatility, if the fact that, you know, we hear the value goes up and the value goes down? Well, we're hearing it all right now because the media has picked up on it and, and they want to watch it as a roller coaster. Now being in Canada, the US dollar goes up and down, not quite as high in percentage wise, but it still moves every second, whether it goes up or down. Right. So in the grand scheme of things, it's extremely close to any other currency worldwide. So people just really need to realize that this stuff is already happening right now. Yes. And if this is in fact the way of the future, which you, which you, call, which you called it, what about the fact that it's not really user friendly, it's still a little bit clunky, it's hard to participate in. Where are we going with that? Uh, well, let, let's go back in time a little bit. Remember when the internet started? Yes. Everybody should probably remember those beep beep beeps when you're dialing into the internet. <laughs> it's been a while since I thought about that. Okay, that was the beginning of the internet. Let's look at the internet today. You're carrying it on your phone. Right. That wasn't that long ago that we started doing that. And talking of phones, remember cell phones? It went from the house phones with the cord to the wireless phone, <laughs> and then the mobile phones were a fad. Right. There's been a lot of fads that are still here, and they're now mainstream. Crypto's currency, if you want to call it the same way, is following the internet 
and the cell phone. Right. That makes perfect sense. And so, you know, with cryptocurrency, we know it's the way of the future, but what are the, some of the benefits that people can take advantage of right now if they're getting involved in an opportunity with crypto? Well, there's multiples. It depends on what the people are actually looking for. Um, I like to classify it bartering. Okay. So you can barter with somebody. You can be having cryptocurrency on your phone with the internet connected, and you can barter a value to somebody when you're, whether you're sitting beside me, whether you're in a city around the uh, around the corner, right, or in a country across the little bit of the ocean, right. Um, it's easy and it's uh, really quick to transfer money without any other questions. So it's easy. It's quick. There's much lower fees from what I understand. Oh yes, there's, uh, it's inexpensive, um, it's secure, it's safe, and it's non-refundable. Which is fantastic. Now, the banking industry isn't getting as involved today as maybe I might have thought that they would have. Why do you think that is? Well, there is a few reasons why I think. Um, it's, it's actually a longer conversation than what we have now. So the Banks are looking at this going, because it's not a currency and because the World Bank doesn't oversee it, yeah. there's issues for them to generate revenue from it. Right. So because cryptocurrency is decentralized, meaning there is no central location that everything goes through, like a bank is going through, everything goes through their bank. Right. Uh, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to control the flow of revenue. Right. And I guess part of where the control has been removed and become a bit more centralized is with everything being tracked on a blockchain. Correct. Yeah. The one great thing, again, with cryptocurrency is it is all visible by everybody. People can see that 300 ABC XYZ coin has been transferred at this time at this second. Right. And the blockchain also provides some other benefits. What would that look like? Well, the security of the blockchain is unheard of up until the blockchain was created. So the blockchain cannot be hacked because there is not one location that it is sitting on for somebody to go to. If right. you have a thousand people that are watching that transfer of the ABC XYZ transfer, there's a thousand people that have seen it happen. If only one person saw it happen, then it didn't happen, which means it's not happening. Totally different story. So there's a thousand, if you're in a room of a thousand people and everybody sees you hand somebody some whatever, yeah. everybody has seen it happen, they have proved that it has happened. Absolutely. If you did it behind somebody's back, nobody else seen it, it doesn't happen. Absolutely. So what are your, your closing words for someone who's considering investing or acquiring or purchasing a crypto opportunity? Um, yeah, again, the investing part I'm not too sure about. Um, it's a byproduct of a cryptocurrency. But if you're not in, look at it and get in. Make the right decisions because this is the future. You might as well get in now. I love it. Dean, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your insights. No, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. As you can tell, cryptocurrencies are about so much more than just making a quick buck. It's a chance to be part of a much bigger global community and possibly the future of money. Dean and I continued this conversation with an exclusive follow-up interview where he shared his top tips to evaluate crypto opportunities for both individuals and merchants in order to maximize value and return. You can view this interview and additional topics on our website, thefortunatefuture.com. Coming up after the break, we'll be discussing how to make money investing in real estate without becoming a landlord. Stay tuned. The Fortunate Future is brought to you by Nico, the cryptocurrency powering the Nikola Tesla legacy. Join the Nico community at www.nico.eco. Nikola Tesla was an inventor and futurist who helped shape our world. Nikola Tesla Unite Limited was formed to advance his visions of making the world a better place for all. Using a cryptocurrency called Nico, Nikola Tesla's legacy is being taken to new places in ways never before imagined. Nico is the center of a digital economy that brings like-minded people together. Those who believe in the vision of Nikola Tesla are part of the Nico economy. 
that aims to empower everyone with the ability to achieve their dreams. For more information, visit www.nico.eco. We all dream of having passive income coming into our bank accounts so that we can have more of a financial cushion and the financial freedom to either indulge a little more or simply cover our needs. However, having the necessary 20% down payment and the dreaded thought of being a landlord dealing with nightmare tenants holds many of us back from investing in real estate. There's several ways to invest in real estate without actually becoming a landlord. With me in studio is Mitch Parker, real estate wealth expert and founder of Mitch Parker Group. So Mitch, what are some of the ways that people can benefit from investing in real estate without actually being a landlord? Sure, so there's actually quite a few different ways. And I mean, first to step back for a second, I think when everybody talks about investing in real estate, they just assume they're gonna become a landlord and they're gonna get a call at like two in the morning and there's gonna be a toilet that's overflowing somewhere. Totally. And they're gonna to have to go and deal with it, right? But the reality is there's actually a lot of ways to get involved without actually having to worry about that 2 a.m. call. So, you know, um, just to you know, fire off a few things sure. offhand, you know, you get things like a private mortgage, um, a joint venture partnership where your partner's actually doing the work and you're just sort of the, the cash and the mortgage guy. Um, there's managed real estate programs out there, there's private equity, there's, there's all sorts of them out there. And so with all of these various options, why do you think people don't actually know about them? I mean, I think the main thing is if you look at who's doing the advertising in the finance industry, you're getting the big banks, right? Because they have all the dollars mm. to put into it. So, you know, I've talked to actually people in the financial industry and they don't even know that a private mortgage is an option of something they could do. That makes a lot of sense. Of course, they're not the ones spending the dollars. So let's start with private mortgages. Tell right. me a little bit about that. Sure. So um, essentially, it's the same thing as if you were to buy a house and go into a bank and get a mortgage. You know, um, as you know, the regulations and restrictions have got a lot more tight in the current market yes. right now. So um, the the perfect client, should we say, uh, is getting smaller and smaller in terms of the bank's criteria. Right. So what that's doing is it's driving a lot of people on the private side of the industry. So what they have to do is they find somebody who has, um, you know, who's maybe not happy with the returns they're getting in their current investments, and they're actually able to lend money to that person and as security, they're actually getting their name put on title of the house. So actually, you know, average people like you and I can be the lenders as opposed to one of the big banks in Canada. That's right. That's exactly what it is. And it's the same process as a big bank and a person going on. And you get the security of being on title. That's right. And that's why when you're doing things like due diligence, the property and the analysis of it is so important to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah. So talk to me about one of the others, maybe joint venture partners next. Sure. So uh, that's kind of how I actually got into the business. My jo first joint venture partner was my dad. I love uh, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I came, I uh, was doing renovations construction at the time. Yeah. And uh, I said to him, I said, Dad, I have a crew of guys and some finance knowledge. You have a little bit of money and the ability to qualify for a mortgage. I was like early 20s at this point. Right. And uh, he's like, OK, let's start looking for a property. And we found uh, a rental property. And you know, when we found the perfect property, um, it worked out exactly like that. You know, he put up the money and qualified for the mortgage. Right. And I found tenants and managed it. And then we just became partners. And, you know, this was a little different. It's my dad and I. For sure. But it could go with, you know, two totally random strangers. Absolutely. So tell me a little about private equity. Sure. So private equity is typically geared for somebody who's willing to take a more of a risk with their capital and who doesn't need cash flow. So if you're a lender to a mortgage, you're typically paid every month. Whereas private equity, what you're actually doing is partnering up with the developer, owning a share in that development corporation, right. and then you share in the profits on the back end once it's actually built. So it's a different way to do it. And how is that different from maybe the situation where you may be working directly with the developer on a managed project? Right. So um, in terms of like a managed project, so what's happening is a lot of pre-construction condos that are coming out now. Oh, they are everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. And they are offering um, management incorporated when you purchase. So they might say, you know, we'll lease your unit for you for the first year or two years or, you know, we're working on something right now that's that's a five year management program. Right. And so, you know, on an equity scenario, you're in at the beginning before construction, helping them get across the finish line. When you're in a managed proper project, 
what you're doing is you're actually buying a unit and get, then getting it managed on your behalf. Right. So what would you maybe recommend for someone who maybe doesn't want to be a landlord, mm -hmm. you've got this variety of different strategies, how would they evaluate and decide which one may be the right one for them to start with? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. Uh, first and foremost, it's got to tie into your goals, right? Like, what are you really trying to accomplish by doing this? Right. And also at the same time, what is your risk tolerances? So somebody who's on the more conservative side, um, who really wants their name on title, they would probably look towards more of like uh, a private mortgage, more of a managed property, whereas somebody who's willing to take a little more risk, they may be you know, more tempted by the uh, private equity. Right. And so, you know, in all of these scenarios, obviously, you're not working with the big banks. It's maybe with private developers or other individuals. Right. What would maybe be your tip in terms of evaluating whether or not it's a good deal for you? Obviously, it's got to align with your goals, like you sure. just mentioned. But what would people need to look at to decide if it's a good deal for them? Um, so first and foremost, I mean, I think you have to look at the actual deal. So the actual development, right? So let's say, for example, it's a real estate development and they're offering a five-year management agreement with it. Right. So that management agreement could be amazing, right? The actual contract could be written with all sorts of benefits to you as the owner, but if the development sucks, it doesn't then, help you either. then it doesn't help you either. So looking at the underlying asset of everything. So again, we're talking private mortgages. We're saying, look at the actual house in these managed developments, look at the actual development. On the private equity, what is gonna be built, who's gonna do it is another important thing too, right? Does right. the people doing it have a track record of success? Have they done this before? So I think what to keep in mind, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that in reality, you are still connected to real estate. There's still an asset, so you wanna make sure that you're evaluating the strength of that. And that's really the benefit of real estate investing in general, is you do have the asset. There you go. Thank yeah. you so much, Mitch. Really appreciate Thank you your for time having today. Me. There are many ways to invest in real estate without having to be a landlord which allows you to make the kind of returns you've been dreaming of. Mitch and I continued this conversation with an exclusive follow-up interview where he shared the top five things to evaluate in a managed real estate development. You can view this interview and additional topics on our website, thefortunatefuture.com. Coming up after the break, we'll be discussing how to respond to economic pessimism in the market headlines when you've invested in commodities. So stay tuned, we'll be right back. The Fortunate Future is brought to you by Nico, the cryptocurrency powering the Nikola Tesla legacy. Join the Nico community at www.nico.eco. Nikola Tesla was an inventor and futurist who helped shape our world. Nikola Tesla Unite Limited was formed to advance his visions of making the world a better place for all. Using a cryptocurrency called Nico, Nikola Tesla's legacy is being taken to new places in ways never before imagined. Nico is the center of a digital economy that brings like-minded people together. Those who believe in the vision of Nikola Tesla are part of the Nico economy that aims to empower everyone with the ability to achieve their dreams. For more information, visit www.nico.eco. We want to stay abreast of world news and, of course, anything that may, in fact, impact our investment portfolio. It can be nerve-wracking to read pessimistic economic headlines, especially when your investment portfolio includes commodities. How should you interpret them, and how do you avoid unnecessary panic? With me now is Rubina Ahmed Huck, personal finance columnist. Now, Rubina, when we hear about commodities, whether that's invested in gold or silver, energies or agriculture, regardless of if it's through ETFs, futures, or of course, crypto assets, folks who are invested in those are often hearing what's happening in the headlines. What suggestions do you have for them in terms of how they should react or lack thereof when they're hearing what's happening in the news? If you're heavily invested in any commodity, so say you've gone all in on oil, and um, you're hearing that the price of oil is expected to fall for whatever news is out there and it's putting pressure on the price of oil, you should be 
uh, either speaking to a financial advisor if you are working with one or doing research to figure out whether it's time for you to get out of that commodity. But generally speaking, you shouldn't be too heavily weighted in anything, whether it be in gold or oil or a certain stock or all bonds or all cash. You should always be well diversified. That's the term we all love to use because that really is the best way that you're going to protect yourself. So even if you know, if you're if you've invested in all sort of uh, gold stocks, but and all of a sudden gold is not doing so well, the rest of your portfolio is going to carry you through at the time when maybe gold prices are a little bit suppressed. Absolutely, and I think that's a that's a great principle. I have heard a lot of people really focusing on gold or otherwise. You know, in the event that the world should end and stocks should crash, um, so there's definitely a lot of people focusing there. But I think that you're absolutely right when it comes to investing overall, you want to make sure that you have elements of diversification. So I was going to say, you know, in that instance where you are invested in commodities, if the headline news is not where you really should get your updates, where is a good place to better understand what's happening with commodities in general? <laughs> well, not that I'm saying you should ignore the headline news, because I think it's still important to be in the know of what's happening. Of course. Uh, but you really need to look at, look back, really. Um, so if you're invested in oil, for an example, oil is a good uh, example of how you can sort of play a commodity. We often talk about this. Is that when you look at the price of oil, it often peaks and comes down, peaks and comes down. So you know that when it's starting to peak, maybe this is the time you want to get out of it. I personally have just sold a lot of oil stocks because I feel like you know, we are now in a position where we're going to see oil prices come down. But that's not advice I'm giving. That's just the way that I feel when I'm looking at the chart, looking backwards, saying we've now kind of reached a point where it doesn't look like it has much more upside to it. So I'm going to get out because I don't feel comfortable anymore. Um, that's one way you can do it by looking back and seeing how that commodity sor sort of acts. Um, you can also speak again to your financial advisor and maybe you want to talk to somebody who is an expert in the commodity that you are invested in. If you have a lot of money in silver. You want to be speaking to someone who really is an expert in that uh, because you don't want to lose your, you know, start losing your investments. Uh, but again, being well diversified, buying stocks that are, uh, you know, broad based, um, good dividend paying stocks, and then also having a bit of maybe, maybe you have an ETF that focuses on the on gold or rice or agriculture or any kind of commodity that you can think of. Yeah. Um, that's okay, but you don't want to be 50% in or all in on anything because then you're really going to be affected by that headline news that you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think part of why we're hearing commodities come up a little bit more is as people are exploring cryptocurrencies, which we all know is a currency that yep. is backed by nothing. You know, in many instances, people are saying, okay, a crypto asset may be a great place to start because there is gold or something or something like that in the background. So that's where I've been hearing a little bit more of a focus on the commodities themselves. So whether it's crypto assets, whether it's otherwise, if commodities is something that's important to you, what do you recommend in terms of rebalancing or revisiting a portfolio? And it may not be that different than any other types of elements that you manage, but how would you think about kind of checking in on those? So uh, when it comes to your investments, you should understand where you are invested. Don't leave it in the hands of the person that you're, that's sitting across the desk. Don't leave it in the hands of reading one website that says, this is the perfect model of how you should invest, and then you just put your money into it. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you are sort of maybe at the end of the year, that's when, people, that's when I often rebalance. I kind of look at, okay, what did really well this year? What didn't do so well? Where should I move my money around? Or if I have a chunk of money, especially during RRSP time, when we often tend to sort of put in enough uh, money into our RSP so we can make a bigger contribution, where should I put that money to kind of give my portfolio um, as sort of a stable uh, future, uh, as diversified as possible, as, as possible so going forward I won't be affected again by that headline news or by, you know, one sort of uh, president or leader of a country making an announcement and all of a sudden your whole portfolio is affected by that news. Absolutely. So that's my best advice is to, um, you know, really know where you are invested and then know how those commodities or those stocks and bonds or whatever it is that you're invested in usually behave. I mean, we know that in times of recession, pro price of oil probably will drop a little bit because people drive less, people don't buy cars as much. I mean, things, you know, people cut back on extras and so we can see that that, that the price of oil might fall. So be aware of how different things act in different environments so that you can be prepared and that you won't all of a sudden start worrying when you see your portfolio dip a little bit. You know that that when the cycle changes, you're going to be just fine. Absolutely, and I've heard you talk about the fact that when you're investing, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's about achieving your goals in your life, your financial goals, your lifestyle goals, mm -hmm. and obviously, commodities would be a piece of that puzzle. 
Yeah, I mean, you you know, some people love to invest in real estate because they understand it. They can go and look at it. They know that that it's going to, you know, over time it's going to it's going to serve them well. Where you know, on average, real estate goes up about six percent a year. So they feel they understand it. And most of us have bought one house in our lives, so we understand the process. The stock market is a little bit different because it does feel a little bit. It's not tangible. We That's don't right. understand it. So we do have to do a little bit more work to understand how it works and to understand what our own risk tolerance is. Maybe you are very conservative. I am actually much more conservative when it comes to my investing than I thought I was. I used to think that I could really handle all the ups and downs. But 2008, 2009, I mean, I was in my mid-30s then. And I remember thinking, I don't have the stomach for this. You don't have this. it for it anymore. So I realized after that that I've got to invest with a bit of a more conservative mindset because I don't what I thought have that kind of risk tolerance that uh, going in where I all of a sudden wake up and yes, my portfolio is down 10%, but it's okay. But if you if you can manage that, because you know over time that you're gonna do okay. Well, then. I love that Warren Buffett says, rule number one, don't lose any money. Rule number two, see rule number one, right? Yes, exactly. So we yeah. wanna make sure that we're moving in the right direction towards our long-term goals. Rubina, thank you so much. I really appreciate all those insights on commodities. It's definitely helpful and I appreciate your time here today. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Regardless of what you are investing in, making your decision based on headline news can cause you in a knee-jerk reaction to make impulsive choices which can result in you losing your hard-earned money. Ensure that you do your own analysis and that your portfolio is diversified so that a decline in any one investment won't impact you that much. That wraps up today's show. Be sure to tune in every week to learn about cryptocurrency, investing in real estate, and personal finance. I'd like to thank my guests, Dean, Mitch, and Rubina, for being here on today's show. For more information, be sure to check out our website, thefortunatefuture.com, where you can find additional online content. Thanks for watching. I'm Lee Moore Markman. Until next time, your fortunate future awaits. The Fortunate Future is brought to you by Nico, the cryptocurrency powering the Nikola Tesla legacy. Join the Nico community at www.nico.eco. Hairstyling provided by Hair Love by LB Hair. Hair products provided by Kevin Murphy.